10 o'clock session, how do we reconnect a principal panel led by Frank Robinson, SCDE Office of Educator Effectiveness and Leadership Development Education Associate. I'm Dr. Gerard Evans, the moderator. I want to remind you just of some Zoom etiquette. Remember to um, mute your microphone in order to hold down the background noise. If you have questions, we ask you to put them in the chat. Uh, and then there'll be a question and answer period at the end of our, um, our session. Just a brief uh, introduction of Dr. Robinson. Uh, Dr. Robinson is a facilitator for the South Carolina Department of Education Principal Induction Program. He has worked with elementary, middle school, and high school levels during his career. Uh, Dr. Robinson has coached uh, school administrators over, over a decade and appreciates the opportunity to learn from other leaders. And most recently, uh, he was voted the most interesting man in the Office of Educator Effectiveness and Leadership Development. <laughs> Dr. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. I think there's a little embellishment with that, but I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, again, everyone, welcome to our session. We're glad you're here. Uh, we've got an incredible panel. I am Frank Robinson, as you just heard. Uh, having said that, you heard a little bit about me, but let me go ahead and let my panel members introduce themselves and then we'll get along with the questions and then there will be time at the end for some uh, questions from you, but you're welcome to drop them in the chat at any point so we can go ahead and get to those. Uh, if, we, if it's all right, we'll just go ahead and go alphabetically with Principal Mary Nell Anthony. Hi, thank you all for having me. I am Mary Nell Anthony. I'm in my seventh year as principal of Greenville Technical Charter High School. Um, prior to coming into the public charter school world, I worked in Anderson School District 5 for approximately 20 years and um, did a variety of things, but ended there um, as academy director at T. Ohana High School, um, where I served for about seven years there as well. So um, it's really an honor to be here and, and appreciate Frank giving me this opportunity. Uh, well, thank you. And then if I remember my alphabet correctly, we should have Dr. Robin Coltrane next. Hello, everyone. I'm Robin Coltrane. This is year seven as principal of W.A. Perry Middle School in Richland 1. Um, this is year 22 in Richland 1. Prior to principalship, I was a, an assistant principal at Hand Middle School at the um, alternative school. And I spent 15 years of my life in special education as a consultant and a teacher. Um, it's a great opportunity to be here. Love what I do. And thank you, uh, Frank, for the opportunity to be here. Well, Y'all are too kind. And uh, while we're doing the introductions, we have Christy Dodd from over in Flat Rock Elementary School. Good afternoon, everybody. Also, thank you for having me. Um, I have been in education for 32 years. 23 of those have been in South Carolina, the first nine in Georgia. I actually crossed the state line across the Savannah River every day to come to work. But I've been, this is the sixth year that I have been principal at Flat Rock Elementary School. Before that, I was a middle school English teacher and an avid coordinator. And um, fun fact, Frank Robinson was my mentor when I went through PIP. So Frank, it's good to see you again. Oh, thank you. And I appreciate you highlighting the fact that I'm getting old, but I appreciate that. <laughs> and I'm there the with folks, you. <laughs> to the folks in the audience, we have some prepared questions. We're going to go through it again. You will have the opportunity to ask some other questions. Please drop them in the chat at any time. Uh, one of the things that I'm most excited about uh, facilitating this group is the fact that I've had the good fortune at some point to be in all of these principal schools. Uh, we've got a snapshot from different spots around the state. These are incredible school leaders and they're doing incredible things in their school. So uh, again, I appreciate them making themselves available for this time. So having said that, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and start with our first question. And our first question is uh, pretty straightforward. It, and the question itself is, how is your school making sure that families feel welcomed and valued? Because the whole point of this panel is talking about how are we reconnecting with our stakeholders? Uh, and a little bit later, we'll talk a little bit, are we involving them or are we engaging them? Uh, semantics perhaps, but I think there's, there's a, a true difference there. So again, the first question is, how is your school making sure that families feel welcomed and valued? And I believe Christy will start. Okay. 
Um, this is an extremely important question, and I want to preface it by saying that in our school, we really look at our our family surveys, our Title I family surveys that we do at the end of the year. And one of the glaring things last year was that um, parents were ready to get back into our schools. They were tired of being locked out. And so we have made a concerted effort to honor that request with our families. And I know that looks different at different levels, but just, you know, it's small things that you do to help people feel welcomed and valued. So we have opened our schools back up again. We had an open house this year that was that was face to face. We have um, we've allowed parents to come in for lunch again. We're doing face to face conference student conferences this year. We're trying um, to get our parents in in any way we can, and that is involving parents. And I think the the key here is communication and making sure that we're communicating on a regular basis and making sure that when people have questions of us that we are responding in a timely fashion. The rule at Flat Rock is 24 hours. And I, and I tell families from up front, I expect somebody to get back to you within 24 hours if you have a concern. And, and we, so we do a lot of things and a lot of, a lot of night activities to get our families and that's involved, but to really get them engaged we also do um, our best to engage them in our Title I committees and our school improvement committees so that they can bring a voice to the table and offer up suggestions and give their concerns. And I'm just gonna remind you, it is really important. The reason we're here is because of these families and we can't do everything they want, but I think it's important to show them that we are hearing them and listening to them and trying to implement some of their suggestions in all of our processes. Thank you, I appreciate that. Dr. Robin Coltrane. Hey, I wanna ditto everything she says. We started cascading a message that we are open um, because they really wanted to be in. I mean, we were not letting people in. I mean, they were at the door, everything was done virtually. And we'll probably do some things virtually for some of our parents, we'll offer both because for some of our parents the, who are working two jobs, the virtual world seems to work. But cascading that message that we are open, communication, she said it, I can't say it enough. Um, I think it's better to over communicate. And so there's a Sunday newsletter that goes out every Sunday to our parents called What's Happening at WA Perry. It kind of lays out the week and sometimes that calendar will go two weeks out with letting parents know how they can be involved, how they can be engaged, surveys. Our back to school bash was face-to-face -face this year for, um, we hadn't had it in a couple of years. Our open house, I was so happy to see um, the people who came to our open house last week. Um, it was just amazing to have families back in the building and uh, we gave away popcorn and told them, thank you for popping in. But they were so happy to be back in the building because they could actually see their child's classroom. We're Title I school too, so we involve our parents in that Title I process. Uh, we're required to have that um, feedback, bo feedback box in the front of our school, and so we check it periodically to see. Our school social worker, they did a 30 for 30, you know, 30 home visits in the first 30 days of school. So I've had the opportunity to go out with her so that they actually see me as well. <laughs> we're still trying to find ways to keep them engaged and it's so funny because I have a listing that I got from the, the staff about ways that we can engage them ways they want to be engaged and so um, one of the suggestions we're having our annual title one meeting on Monday and we always do it around a state fair theme and so they love that we give away the state fair passes you know so we're doing that again and having them come in, um, providing them that opportunity to be with their family. We're going to offer Zumba again. We haven't had our paint and punch with the principal in probably three years, so we're bringing it back, and we've got to cap it because that's a pretty uh, popular event. We have it in the courtyard on the, a nice evening, and we have like a paint and sip kind of party, and then we get our SICPTO to come out, um, neighborhood associations to come out, 
to make sure that we're providing information that families need to know. And so um, I think just communicating and letting them know that you hear them has been has worked for us in trying to get back in the swings of things post COVID. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Principal Anthony, what would you like to say? I hate to say that going last after two really great answers is a challenge because <laughs> they've said so many great things. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, I do think when, when they speak of the communication piece, I think that's really important to directly communicate the message. If you want your parents to feel welcomed into your school, then all of your messaging has to say you are welcome here, right? So, so in our opening orientation, when I did parent sessions, the first slide, you know, said, we are glad that you are here. Um, thank you for showing up. That's always the very first thing that I open when I talk to parents, when I message that. Um, we do, as they mentioned, have a variety of ways to get them involved. Um, you know, your general open house student-led conferences to bring them in, as they said, those are back face-to-face. -face. Um, we encourage them to come in face-to-face -face and not to just do virtual if possible. As Dr. Coltrane mentioned, for some of our families, that's a really difficult to ask. So we take that into consideration. And then, you know, pairing events. So before our open house, we had a club fair. And so that way the parents to learn all about the club opportunities and meet all the club sponsors at the same time. Um, and then I would also just add listening, as they mentioned, and taking the suggestions. And then if you can't implement what they want, it's finding to them why. Like, this is a great idea, but here's why it didn't work. And having that line of communication with your parents, ours is a parents in partnership. It's not a traditional PTO, but it serves the same function. Um, and having that, that communication link between that, I think is really powerful. Um, yeah. I think that's it. There's a lot more, but. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll be able to hit on, on some of that. Um, as we keep going. And I appreciate that. And for the audience, I want to make sure uh, that you understand that we do have a representative from the elementary world, the middle school world, high school world. Um, again, and Principal Mary Nell Anthony is also kind of doing dual roles for us in, in terms of this, uh, this panel, because she could also able to shed some light on how things are in the charter world. And obviously, you know, every school is unique, every school is special. I, I don't want to diminish that, but we have a variety of viewpoints here. Um, and I, again, I, I think that's very important when we're trying to have conversations about some of the great things that are going on in education that may not always be highlighted. So we heard some, some good ways of how we're trying, um, based on these three schools, to engage folks. Uh, heard about the intentional messaging. And also the transparency, which is also just, that's a great leadership trait, um, you know. And I'm gonna piggyback off a question and, and I'm gonna go straight to Dr. Robin Coltrane with this. You touched about on this a little bit, but maybe we can go a little bit deeper. Um, you talked about how you wanted to, you, you asked folks how they wanted to be engaged. And so that piggybacks on the question in terms of how are you as school leader uh, striving for active two-way communication and outreach? You know, I mean, communication, true communication and true involvement is more than just sending out stuff and making sure somebody can get something 24 seven online is that two way piece. Um, so if we'll start uh, with that question and if we can start with Dr. Robin Coltrane and then we'll just move through to uh, Mary Nell Anthony and then Christy Dodd. Okay, so. You know, we're always working on that. And, and at a leadership meeting this summer, we kind of talked about getting our families engaged and having those conversations and dialogues. Um, one way is we try to empower them through our SRC PTO, and we know everyone does not come, um, but we really try to encourage them to join those meetings, to join our Title I meetings. Uh, we started something new this year. At the, the last week of every month, so we started at the last week of August, we have these um, positive phone calls. Like parents get calls for everything else. But that last week of the month, we have our whole school broken down. And so every kid is getting a call. Every parent is getting a call. And the first week we had a, a strip that went along with it. Hey, my name is Dr. Coltrane. 
I'm calling from W.A. Perry Middle School. We're just so excited to have your child join with us. We want to partner with you and your family to make this a great school year. Um, we're just calling to say I'm very, very happy to have Frank here at W.A. Perry Middle School. Is there anything that we can do to assist you to make this school year great? And so everybody knows that they have to make those calls uh, some teams do it on Wednesdays, some keeps, teams do it on Thursday, and we ask the teachers to do it during their planning period. And they've been fine because it's only like eight to 10 children that they are calling. We also started two years ago where every kid in the school has a mentor. We call it our CAP program. And we started yesterday. I lost my eighth graders last year because they left. I had eighth grade. So now I've started with a new group of sixth graders that I will move up with until they go to eighth grade. And having those, I have six this year. Um, having those kids have been great because it helps establish those relationships with parents. And so now I'm, I'm calling, I'm not calling as your principal. I'm calling as the mentor. And so I think that you, when you have somebody who's your mentor and you're developing that relationship with, and I've got three years to develop that relationship with parents, then they feel like they have somebody that they can talk and they can communicate with. So Dr. Witherspoon challenged us by 2023, 24, every kid, I'm sorry, y'all, every kid has to have a mentor, but we started it early and it's been beneficial with us um, working with our parents and starting that two-way kind of communication and feeling comfortable and having them feel comfortable, open up about um, academics, uh, family concerns, their needs. And so that's been beneficial for us, um, doing things a little bit different when you're in a Title I school. Thank you for, for sharing that. And I appreciate the long-term view. We're not doing it just to check off a box. We're not doing it just because the superintendent said, oh, we're going to end up doing this. But we have a long-term commitment to our students. Yeah, and let um, me just add one other thing because um, it's a trust factor. And if that is not there, and so we, we've got to build in those supports so that they feel like um, we're trustworthy. Thank you. Chris. She gave a really good answer. I'm going to try to follow that. Um, you know, everything starts with building relationships and that requires communication. And so one thing I would, I would challenge anybody listening to this with is to make sure that your communication is consistent. My families know that at 6.15 on Sunday night, they are going to hear my voice on a recorded call and I'm going to give them information. And I'm certainly not, you know, I'm not being paid to plug, but I will tell you something that our, our district has done for the past two years. We use an app, a program called Aptg and Thrillshare. And I don't, I don't know if you are familiar with that or not, but our families like information instantly. They like it quick. And with the use of that program, we are able to do a phone call, do an email, do a push notification and a text, one message all at the same time. And in, in emergency situations, that's very important because you all know when you've had to go to the hallway for a tornado or, you know, or bad weather or something has happened or you've had to lock the building down, parents and, and, and community members do get very, um, they get very upset because they feel like they should have known something quicker. And so I would encourage you if you are at the district level or even the school level as a leader, make sure you have a consistent um communication plan we do in Anderson 3 and because the feedback that we get from families is that they are so thankful for this information and the other thing I'm going to add to that is that one of the things our families in, in our surveys reached out to us and told us is that they love 
getting all of the digital messaging that we are able to use. But some of them still felt like they needed phone calls, written communication. And so one of my, my efforts this school year has been not only to publish things digitally into our social media, but I am using the paper and I am sending home those monthly newsletters from our school in Friday folders with elementary children because our parents like to have something to put up on the refrigerator. They like reminders. And quite honestly, some of my families may not have access um, as much as others do to, um, to digital services. And so just remember that, that we've got all different types of, of people in our communication, in our communities. And so that we need to remember that one size does not fit all and that clear, consistent communication that they expect um, goes a long way with our families. Well, and I appreciate you sharing not only that resource in terms of that app, but also the importance of the intentionality. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like a laser-like focus in terms of how we're getting that information out, not just what's easy for us, which, I mean, sometimes if we're gonna be honest, the digital, aspect of it is a little bit easier you know you just click a few buttons and it's there um, but just recognizing that's even within uh, our communities around the state there's lots of similarities but there are also some differences and not everybody in our uh, in our communities yes they probably have a smartphone but maybe they don't have data for some of the video messages we're doing on flip or some of those other things and uh, I will also just highlight even though my kids are out of elementary school and definitely don't live in your attendance zone. I like the idea of getting that piece of paper that I can stick on the fridge because that's how I keep myself straight. So I'm glad you didn't get some of those folks who like those old school messaging as well. Um, Mary now, would you like to add anything? Sure. Um, I like that idea that the paper, we actually, we try to set all the major dates for all of our major events that are expected. Um, and we put it on a magnet that's sponsored by a local bank so that at the beginning of the year, when they come to that orientation, they're handed that magnet that goes on that fridge, um, which is really nice because then they've got the student-led conference date, the open house date, the warrior madness date, all of those dates that are, are key signature events at our school, they've got those in advance. And then, you know, we do other things that might be a little more, you know, two weeks notice out, but, but for our key signature events, we've got those that they get every year and know them before the school year even starts. Um, at high school, I think it is a challenge sometimes because students get to high school and the parents, you know, either they're like, oh, we're done, we're done, they're ready for high school. Or, um, you know, the, just the high school teachers and the, the general demeanor of a school is very often, you know, more of a, you need to start disconnecting. And so they don't always feel as engaged and welcomed at the high school level, in my opinion. So we've made a concerted effort. Um, one of the unique things that I think is at my school is that we um, use our parents as volunteers for a lot of our chaperones. So, you know, for prom, we have parent chaperones. For um, speech and debate, we use parent volunteers to, to um, come and judge that. If we do, I mean, just any event, murder mystery dinner, you know, we want parents there. And so we give sign up slots and it's not that admin's not there. There's not a teacher presence there, but we invite and welcome. And I always tell them your kids are going to be like, oh, no, mom, don't come. But they're so used to our school community is so accustomed to that. There's going to be parents around all the time that that's just a norm. And, and I just really enjoy that. Um, we also, as, as we've mentioned before, building that trust level and making sure that they do understand. We have parents that, you know, they didn't grow up with Google Classroom. They didn't grow up with School Do. They didn't grow up with whatever app, whatever thing you use. <laughs> they do not know it. And sure, their kids can sit them down. So we um, have held targeted nights where we directly instruct them on that. And we do offer those in person. So they're sitting at the computer. They're looking at it. They can um, learn how they can best maximize engaging with their children. Um, and that's been really successful. We also offer those virtually, because as you mentioned, despite us being post pandemic and in a non-virtual world right now, 
for some parents, they love the fact that they can just cut it on and be cooking dinner. Um, once a quarter, I do a um, virtual town hall. Um, we do town halls through our advisory program for kids. And so we do a virtual town hall with the principal once a quarter where the parents can log on and we interact and take questions and answer them. And, you know, some of my friends tell me that that's a little bit crazy because I don't know what they're going to ask. So it is definitely sometimes the principal hot seat because um, they will let you know if they don't like something and you're you're on the spot, but that's okay. Because um, then you can in, engage and have that vulnerable transparency that Frank mentioned earlier. Um, and then we have we have the same belief that every student in the building needs a trusted adult. We do that by signing an advisory. So our students go to their advisor Monday through Thursday for 25 minutes. Um, Monday is the day that all of them sent home a report to their advisor and their parents. So we are fortunate that this year we are finally one-to-one. -one. They open that Chromebook and they open it with um, some sentence starters. First sentence starter is, this is something that I'm struggling with or proud of this week. And so they finish that sentence. And then these are my upcoming assignments this week. This is the class that I might need some help in, or this is where I did well this week. And then they list all of their grades. So every Monday, their, their parents, even the ones who can't figure out how to get into power school, or they can't figure out anything else, if they have that email access, they get that. And then those without the email access, we print that sheet to send home. Obviously, that's not quite as effective because you don't know if it mates at home. But we also tell our parents, this is expected. Your child is expected to bring this home every Monday. So if they don't, call us and then we'll make sure that you know. Um, and so those are some things that, that we do. And then lastly, we have a big event, Warrior Madness, um, in the fall. It's our basketball kick kickoff. We're a small school. We don't have a football team. So we do Warrior Madness. It's a free cookout, once again, sponsored by a local community business. Um, cost the school about a thousand dollars for the sponsor like that's what they sponsor so it's free to us um there again parents are volunteering to serve things our pe pit people are there but student government sets up games we encourage the whole family to come so like even though we're high school we have inflatables um we want the little children to come the middle schoolers to come it's a big family event and then they have a big student versus student um or alumni versus student basketball game depending on the year um, and that's just been a real hit because teachers are expected to be there. So it's an informal conversation with teachers that occurs from that. Thank you for sharing that. As I listen to you all, you're making me think of, uh, of a question and it's a little, little different question. So um, I'm gonna pose it and then if anyone is willing to answer it, I'd be glad it doesn't matter the order. Um, but as part of a question, you all have talked about ways that you're using your staff to engage uh, your community members. And, you know, we've got a couple of nice comments in the chat box, you know, Melissa, you know, gave a virtual high five to Dr. Coltrane. She loved the end of the month calls. Uh, you know, I believe it's Makia Johnson said that, you know, she liked the way you all were being intentional. And the fact that, you know, some families are, you know, depending on the area, maybe more than other areas are having some difficulties trusting schools. Um, and, you know, we, we have to have folks trust what we're doing to make sure we can grow kids as much as possible. I mean, the kids have to trust us, the, the community has to trust us. Um, I'm gonna pivot just a little bit to your staff. We know there's a teacher shortage. We know, I think most of us, if we're being genuine, we know that teaching is one of the hardest jobs in the world, one of the most rewarding jobs, but also very hard. Um, you all have mentioned some ways that you're having your staff work on communication and I'm going to extend it and say really a little bit in terms of branding. And when I say in terms of branding, I don't mean in terms of just having a logo, but people say, oh, wait, if this person is from, you know, W.A. Perry or Greenville Technical Charter or Flatwood Rock Elementary. I know they're serious about helping my kids. I know they're genuine about it. So 
is anyone willing perhaps to just take a moment and speak about how are you working with your staff? I mean, it's one thing, um, and I'm not saying you just gave an ultimatum, uh, Dr. Coltrane, and said you're going to make these calls and leave it at that. That's not where I'm coming from. But how do you help your staff make sure the messaging is going out the right way and for them to take ownership of it as well, if that makes sense? Well, well I know. think, I, oh, I'm Go sorry. Ahead. I think I've, ca- I think, I take the responsibility a lot of casting that vision for what it is I like to see for our school. And I think because we've had turnover at my school in, in terms of administration. So I've been here seven years and I'm, I'm probably the longest principal in over 20 years. So I'm not saying that to brag, I'm saying that that I think now they believe, they trust, they saw the commitment level and we don't have a high turnover rate in, in our teachers, a very low turnover rate. And I think they see, okay, um, she didn't leave at the three, you know, she's here, she's serious, she's committed to this level of work. And we really involved them. I got to give it to my assistant principals and how they work with their grade level teams and their content level teams, how we've done some work in our leadership teams to empower people to lead. And so I think that has, the trust factor has been there. We've done some team building. We trust each other. We know what our school needs are. Um, We know that our children fight some really, really hard battles outside of the walls of our school. So we've talked a lot about making school a safe, sacred place where they can come, feel loved, be a kid, despite what's happening in the neighborhood. Um, and it's important, we, you know, we talk about, we have some really co- hard conversations about poverty and the things that plague our children and the neighborhoods that they come from. And, but they're still children and they're still good children. And every parent wants to hear something positive about their kid. So we talked about, yeah, we've got to make all these calls about missing assignments and everything else. But let's start making calls about some good things. And so that led to, we have something called positivity at Perry on Mondays and Fridays. This came from related arts teachers, you know, wanting to hold up positive signs in the hallway on Mondays and Friday. Everybody was laughing at, at us at first, but now the kids are like, where's your sign or your shirt? But empowering them to lead Um, empowering them to come out of their comfort zone. And we're about to embark on restorative practices. And so getting to that piece, we we needed to do all the other front loading stuff. So now we're at a place where we're ready to have some conversations about restorative practices and um, how to solve issues other than suspensions, because that doesn't always work, you know? And so I think it was building a lot of other pieces of the ship that kind of led to this piece and then allowing them, instead of me just saying, hey, this is what we need to do. What do you all think we need to do? What, what's our biggest, how can we make a, a greater impact? You know, And it does help with the branding of your school. You know, It does help with some other areas. You know, It does help when we ask our community partners you know, will you consider doing X, Y, and Z for our school, especially when they see that you're good stewards of the resources that they're putting into the school, you know? And so I just, I say all that to say that I think it's several layers that have helped get to that point where they feel empowered now. Okay, she's willing to let us take a risk, you know? She's willing to let us go a little to the left. Okay, come on back, come on back. But I'm gonna let you go a little to the left. So I think I think that has helped allowing them, empowering them to lead. You know, I always tell them, if you bring me a problem, bring me a solution. Mm-hmm. You know, bring up a, a possible solution or two. So I don't know if that answered, but that's what has worked for us. Yeah, uh, I appreciate you sharing. We've done a great deal of work with collective efficacy among our, our staff members so that they are empowered to lead. Um, and we also, we kick off every year you know, it's my seventh year, so you got to come up with some new way to do it. (laughs) But every year we kick off with 
This is our mission, but also these are our belief statements. These are what we believe about how we do our business. And so we have posters of that. We put that up around the school. The teachers know that. And, and so there's some key statements there about building and trusting and all those relationships. And then in our opening, you know, we do once a month faculty meeting. We try to limit meetings, but we do have a once a month in-person mm -hmm. faculty meeting. Um, and as part of that, we do a faculty spotlight. So um, if you've ever gone to a conference where there's like an instant idea presentation, the, the peers get up and they have an eight minutes to share something and highlight something that's going great for their strategy, their classroom, that type of thing. And we try, you know, if we don't have a volunteer, then maybe during our observations, we saw that you do a really great job with X and we'll go and ask that teacher to, to present that. Um, but also the, the general philosophy of the school, um, you know, is assume the best right? Like they, my teachers want me to assume the best of their intentions, of their professionalism, of what they have going on. In return, I ask them to assume the best of me, but then we need to extend that to assume the best of our children, mm -hmm. right? Maybe the reason that the kid didn't do the homework isn't that they're lazy. Maybe the reason the kid didn't do the homework is because they weren't organized. They didn't write it down with an agenda. They don't have the, you know, the skill level in order to have that, um, you know, right now the, the word for all those skills, but the soft skills needed, the executive functioning skills to, to execute that. Maybe they struggled and they didn't know how to reach out for help. So we directly teach them those things. And then maybe, you know, they have that, that situation where they go home and they are the parent at home. We, you know, a lot of people assume, oh, you're public charter. You don't have those issues. Um, we have those issues. We, we have 22% 504 IEPs. We have poverty, we have homeless, we might have less of them, and we might have parents who, who decided they picked us, so that's already a plus, but we have, we have issues, and some parents picked us because we're known for parenting their kids, because they don't want to parent their kids, so, so it's a lot of things with that that go into it, and, and so I, I think that assuming the best and understanding um, the why behind um, I know Dr. Coltrane also referenced restorative practices. And so we have been very intentional over the last three years of providing professional development opportunities on restorative practices, trauma-informed learning, mm -hmm. having someone come in and explain, this is how the brain works. This is how the brain works on trauma. This is what that might play out and look like in your classroom. But now here's the kicker. Here's what you do about that, right? Because it's, I don't know about y'all, but my teachers do really well if the traumatized kid is responding in a socially appropriate way. But when traumatized kids respond in a traumatic way, there's a little bit of a less patience and less understanding. And we want people to know we want to understand your kid. We want to partner. Um, we don't do positive phone calls. I'm totally stealing that from Dr. Coltrane's school. But we do positive postcards. And you'll notice, you know, I know you said it's not about a brand, but but they we did deliberately when I got here, pick a brand so that you know when you see the logo, this is our academic brand. Then we have a, you know, we've got our little flying W for our athletic stuff. And then, you know, we we put that on all the things consistently. So when you get something, you know it's us, you know our intentionality. Um, and then lastly, mastery learning process and just embedding yeah you might not think you need to give every kid every opportunity to redo x but what can you do to show them that it's a mastery learning concept what can you do to make sure they know you really want them to get it and it's not a gotcha and by us preaching that and then peers preaching that to each other it trickles down and our parents feel that and and i will add to that um Branding, I think, is important. One of the things that we've done in the last couple of years in our school district is first, the first thing we did is we made everybody's mascot the same as the high school. And we have an initiative now called Tigers Together. And the principals meet, I say we meet without adult supervision once a month. And, and if you know, you know what that means. And we are planning 
things together so that elementary school children are becoming involved at the middle school and the high school and our high school students and our middle school students are becoming involved at the elementary school. For example, we have high school students opening car doors for our children. We have um, our teachers of the year being recognized at halftime of football games. We're doing a community movie night. So when you start making that brand look the same at all of your schools, that does subconsciously provide a level of um, comfort and safety for, for our families. And I want to, to reiterate some things that the other two ladies said. You know, there's a saying, if you look for dirt, you'll find it. So I encourage my teachers to look for the positive and communicate the positive to our families. And something that I understood early on as a principal is there can be, and there needs to be one principal in the building, but there cannot be just one leader in the building. And it is our job as administrators to go out and push those boundaries with our teachers and our other staff members because sometimes you have great leaders in the building that for whatever reason, they don't see that in themselves. And so I participate in, a, in an initiative group. Um, it's um, a national thing with um, Dr. Hans Clark out of Clemson. And one of the things that he's really taught me is to work in action research cycles. And so I have a group of teachers in our elementary school that work on our leadership team. And so I work really hard for the decision-making in our building to be a collective, um, a collective decision. I could make a lot of decisions by myself and they do look to me for guidance. And so that's the other thing I'm going to mention to you is other people need to learn to make decisions um, and you need to grow leaders in your building but just like we expect teachers to model for students, we need to model for our teachers and, te and te tr uh, treat them with that same respect that we're expecting them to give our students. And I promise you that works and it becomes a very positive school culture when you treat your teachers that way because your students are treated even better when that happens. Yeah, I want to thank you all for sharing that. I mean, as I was taking notes, I'm learning some things and feeling a little jealous because I don't have a building to go back and try some of this stuff. So maybe y'all need to let me come be like principal for a day or something. Sure, you know, come on. Come on, you know, come on. Y'all yeah. <laughs> know I'm a little crazy, so but it'd be all right. Um, but as I took those notes, you know, I, I, there was a theme about being consistent, not just in your message, but your approach. Um, you know, and I think not only you all focused on building trust in your community, the outward community, but that also, you know, I think I heard from you all talking about how you're instilling trust with your school, you're within the walls of the school community, um, you know, making sure you're casting a vision, but also building that vision together. You're not just sharing it, you're creating a shared vision, um, you know, and that, that, that continuous communication. Uh, you know, there's there's an old joke and I just came across it in the book and I realized I'd heard it somewhere before, but it basically said that, you know, quite often the illusion of communication is that communication actually occurred. It's a very dry joke. But the fact, you know, sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that we communicated something, communicated something clearly when we haven't. Um, so I appreciate the intentionality that all three of you are bringing to your schools. Um, this will be the last question, and then we'll open it up and see if there's any questions from, from the community. We, you know, we appreciate those of you who are out in the audience that you're here, um, and uh, we definitely want to leave a few minutes for that. But let me ask you this to, to our school leaders. Last few years have been tough. I mean, you know, we don't have to get into the pandemic. We don't have to get whether we're out of the pandemic or at the tail end. I'm not asking any of that. Um, but, you know, I would offer from, from what I read and from going and visiting with school leaders that there's still some challenges based on what happened over the past couple of years. But having said that, it's been difficult, you know, for some schools and, and communities. But if you don't mind sharing, what bright spots have you, have you noted? What bright spots are you seeing in your school that even though it's been tough, 
what are some things we could celebrate? You know, one of the brightest spots has been watching our school community. And I don't mean just inside the walls. I mean, our families, you know, we are a small rural community, but we are supported by our families more than ever. When we have an event and invite our families in, it is truly standing room only. They want to be here more than they've ever wanted to be here. And I think I think after everything we've been through, I think we see their situation in a different light, but I think they're looking at us in a different light as well. And our community partners have just gone over and beyond to help us make sure that our students have what they need and our families have done that. So if there's, there have been so many bright spots in our school community, but if I could just reiterate one it's just that how our community all of our partners have come together to make sure that we are doing what we need to do for our students and it's just a good feeling yeah and i'll echo that the our students which we we don't public charter schools don't receive any money for facilities <laughs> and so we were able in in the last seven years we have worked really hard to to get a student learning center with a gymnasium and um and so for the first time last year our students had we not only were were open but we also had a, a gym where all of our students could come together in the gym for the first time together and and there is just a real significant shift of gratitude and appreciation for both the school and the teachers and each other and the ability to show up and be in school. Um, like the kids just have more excitement. The families have more excitement. They are, they are ready to engage. It's almost like how everyone was ready to travel this summer, right? Like we can finally go out of the house this summer. They are so ready for that engagement. And it just, it shifts that. And, um, and so just that bright spot and level of support and engagement that's there, um, just a feeling of excitement about what the future holds. I, I'm going to echo them too. Like we, we have partners and patrons that like they're people that I didn't even know, know us and bring things and ask what they can do. I sent an email out um, a couple of weeks ago and then prior to summer to about a hundred, I had a listserv of just community people asking for human capital. Like I love all the donations, but I want people in here who, if you only have two hours to give me, I'll take your two hours and then we can place you where we need you. But I want some human capital through here. I want my kids to be able to see some positive role models. And so they've completed the volunteer application and I'm waiting to hear back because I just wanna get some people in here get my kids exposed and several of them have, have written back and said, I'm just waiting to get cleared so I can volunteer. And so that piece of it has been refreshing. And once again, it's part of that message that we're open, you know, that we're open. And so. Um, and it's so different, not in, it's so different than what you're seeing on social media and in the yes. news to actually see that, that in, like you see this, yes. but then in actuality, the local community and the local support is so there, even though so many people are feeling beat up yes. by the national um, verbiage in the, in the news. And it, and it offers the opportunity. I always tell people that um, you have to tell your own story. You got to tell it wherever you go because people are telling another narrative. But if you open it up and allow people to come in, they'll tell your story for you. And then that's another way of branding your school, dismissing the narrative of what's happening in the community, dismissing the narrative that all teachers are disgruntled, you know, dismissing the narrative that people don't want to volunteer, parents don't want to volunteer, because some parents do. You just got to find what works for their schedule. And so just engaging people in the manner in which we, we can engage them, working around their schedule. We start at seven in the morning and our after school ends at six. So we actually have some students from USC 
who get their hours in our after school program. Um, and so if I have a parent or a community member who can volunteer four to six, I'll take it. You know, I'll take it. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, Frank, you want to close it out? Yeah, it's, it's, this, this time has flown by. Um, I was getting ready to, I was typing something in the chat. Uh, I want to thank everyone for participating. I'm getting ready to put my email address in the chat box. It's just frobinson at ed.sc.gov. If a question comes to you later that you would like to have forwarded to uh, these incredible principals, I'll be glad to go ahead and, and send it their way. I want to thank the principals, uh, you know, different parts of the state, different levels. Um, incredible intentionality. Thank you all for making time. I know y'all are busy. I know your schools miss you, but we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with everyone around the state. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to get this gang back together sometime and then continue this conversation in another setting. But thank you all for participating, uh, whether you're on the panel or you're in the audience. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Thank you.